This is chapter four, Differential Relations for Fluid Flow, part two. In this video, I'm going to derive the differential equation for the conservation of mass. As you learned in the previous video, this is called the continuity equation. And in the previous video, I showed you the result. The result is shown here over on the right, so that's what we're going to derive. Then, once we've completed that derivation, I'll show how you can express this in vector notation, which is important for fluid mechanics analysis. Then I'll show how you can simplify the continuity equation, the general form of the continuity equation for incompressible flows, where density is a constant. And then we'll talk about how to uh, derive this equation in cylindrical coordinates. The use of cylindrical coordinates is important when you're analyzing sort of naturally cylindrical objects like flow and pipes. And then we'll end with an example where I give a velocity vector field, V, and I'll show you how to determine if that vector field satisfies conservation of mass or the, or the continuity equation. So I'm going to start with the derivation of the continuity equation in Cartesian coordinates. So as shown in the diagram, we're going to consider a differential control volume with dimensions dx, dy, dz. And this control volume is assumed to be located in an arbitrary velocity vector field, v of the three coordinates x, y, z, and time. And density also can vary with x, y, z, and time. So at this point, we're not making any simplifications. The flow could be fully three-dimensional, it could be unsteady, and it could be compressible. So we start by considering the mass flow rate into this little differential control volume in the x direction. Now you, you remember that mass flow rate is rho times velocity times area, and so that's what we have. We have density times the velocity in the x direction times the area, dy dz is the area of this face here. So that's the mass flow rate in. For the mass flow rate out at x plus dx, we do a little Taylor series here. We take rho u and then dA here is outside the brackets. And then die by dx of rho u dx. The, you know, the dx's will cancel. It'll give you the small change in rho u in that direction. Now, of course, there are higher order terms, and let me rewrite it down here. The mass flow rate out of the control volume, I've rewritten it here, the term rho u and then dy by dx of rho u dx. And of course, there would be higher order terms here. There'd be 1 over 2 factorial, the second derivative in the x direction times rho u times dx squared, and then 1 over 3 factorial, uh, the third derivative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you're doing this kind of analysis, when you let, ultimately, when you let dx go to zero and you're considering a flow at a point, these higher order terms vanish much more quickly than the linear terms, and so we're just left with the, with the uh, linear derivative term here. So that's the x direction. Now you can do exactly the same thing in the y and z directions. You can look at the mass flow in, and I've written the, the terms here for the y direction. So rho v this time times the area dx dz. So now we're talking about this area here. And then I've done the same thing at the top here. I've taken the partial derivative in the y direction of rho v dy and added it onto rho v. And so what you get is the inlet term in the x direction, the outlet term in the x direction. We just showed the inlet term in the y direction, the outlet term in the y direction. And you can do exactly the same thing in the z direction. It's very easy. So now it's just a matter of doing some fairly simple mass flow accounting and making sure that these all balance. Now, I should point out that the flow through each side in this little control volume can be considered one dimensional because ultimately we're going to shrink this control volume to you know, let dx, dy, and dz go to zero. So we're considering flow at a point 
So you don't need to worry about the variation of the flow across each face. From chapter three in our control volume analysis, we showed that conservation of mass can be expressed as the rate of storage in the control volume equals the rate at which mass flows in rate minus the rate at which the rate at which mass flows out. This is just simple accounting, remember? So rate of storage equals rate in minus rate out. You can do the same thing on your bank account. We talked about that. So we have the inlet and the outlet terms. I just need to talk a little bit about the storage term here. This storage term here, we when we derived this, we derived it for a finite size control volume. But right now we're doing an analysis on a differential volume that we're going to let shrink to zero. So you really, as I mentioned, the properties are constant over the over that differential volume as the differential volume shrinks to zero, which is what we do in calculus. And so we don't really need to perform that integration. We can just express this as di rho di t times the incremental volume. And the incremental volume is dx dy dz. So we have our, uh, our, our storage term here, which is the partial derivative of density times the incremental volume. Now we can substitute in, and that's what I've done on the next slide. I've reproduced the table. Here's the table that we had. And I've reproduced the uh, conservation of mass equation for a control volume. Now what we do is we substitute in the inlets and the outlets. But there's a little simplification been, been made here. If you notice that the rho u dy dz here, this term really cancels with this term. So in and out. And what we have here is in minus out. So what you're going to retain is the negative this term times a negative. And similarly, we're going to retain the negative of this term because it's in minus out and we're going to retain the negative value of this term. And so that's what you have is the rate of storage here equals these three terms added up, but they're negative because it's the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out. So now you can see that each one of these terms has dx dy dz, so you can get rid of dx dy dz. And we end up with the final result at the bottom which is the general continuity equation. And that's the final result. It's very simple derivation. It's worthwhile learning how to do this and understanding uh, the result. So I've rewritten the general continuity equation here up on the next slide. I wanted to emphasize that this applies for both steady and unsteady flows. Of course, if it's steady, then the time derivative goes to zero, so this term goes away. But this is the general general form. It's applicable for flows that have viscosity or do not have viscosity, so in viscid flows or viscous flows. It's also applicable for compressible or incompressible flows. In the derivation, we have left density as a function of x, y, z, and time. What I'd also like to do is talk about vector notation, because vector notation is widely used in fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics analysis. So you'll often see in, the, in textbooks and in papers the continuity equation written in, in vector notation. And so I've written it here in vector notation. We have the partial derivative of density with time. And then I want to introduce, you may have seen this before, this upside down triangle if you like. It's called the vector gradient or del operator. And the del operator is just di by dx in the i direction plus di by dy in the j direction, uh, di by z in the k direction, of course, where i, j, and k are the unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction. So you can see, if you note that this little dot here is actually a scalar product or a dot product, that if you applied this operator to this row V, where V has the three components, U in the I direction, V in the J direction, and W in the K direction, you would recover the general, general continuity equation. So 
it's worth learning about and understanding the uh, Dell operator. Here again, I've written the general continuity equation at the top. That's our result that we're working with. What I want to do is simplify this for incompressible flows. For So when you have an incompressible flow, that means that the density is a constant. So density doesn't vary spatially. It doesn't vary in the x, y, or z direction, and it doesn't vary in time. So with that simplification, you can get rid of uh, di rho di t, and you can bring density outside of the derivative. And if you do that in all three cases, then uh, you can cancel density. And you just end up with, this is the incompressible form of the continuity equation. It's di u by di x plus di v by di y plus di w by di z. So the rate of change of the x component of velocity in the x direction, plus the rate of change of the y component of velocity in the y direction, plus the rate of change of the z component of velocity in the z direction, all have to add up to zero when you have uh, incompressible flow. And of course, that's the equation you would use for, for liquids, for most conditions. For gases, you have to worry about compressibility. And we talked about this earlier, that typically you can apply or you can use the incompressible assumption when the Mach number is less than 0.3, where the Mach number is the, the velocity over the speed of sound in the gas. And we talked about this in previous videos. So what, what's a little bit surprising about this equation is that you haven't made the assumption of steady flow. So this equation is valid, this incompressible equation, is valid for steady or unsteady flows, incompressible flows. In vector notation now, this just becomes that del dotted into the velocity vector equals zero. In mathematics, this scalar product of the del operator and a vector is called the divergence. And so in fluid mechanics, we say that in incompressible flows, the divergence of the velocity vector is zero. And that's what, that's what this equation expresses. So that was the derivation in Cartesian coordinates. Now, as I mentioned, for analyzing flow in pipes and other sort of naturally round geometries, it's often convenient to use a cylindrical coordinate system. So instead of x, y, z, now we have r, z, and theta, so some, some radius, some distance z, axial distance, and some angle theta. So a typical point would be defined by three coordinates, r, theta, and z. And now we have three velocity compo components, vr, vz, and v theta. And they're shown, they're shown in the diagram here. Now this seems complicated. But it actually is not very complicated to derive. I'm not going to rederive the uh, continuity equation for this situation, but I'm just going to give you a little hint. You can complete the rest of this on a piece of paper. It takes about a half a page to do this. If you consider, I'm going to show you the hardest one. So if you consider a little cylindrical element now, now if you do the mass balance, what you've got to consider, and here's the little trick here, is that this distance here is r d theta. Remember that's arc length. And so now if you're considering the r component of velocity, you have rho vr. Now you want to get times dA. Now dA is the arc length r d theta times dz. And then you do exactly the same thing at r plus dr. You express this little uh, linear derivative. So rho vr times di by dr of rho vr and then times this here which is dA. From here, it's pretty easy to complete the rest of the analysis. You could try this as an exercise if you want. And then what you get is the continuity equation that I've shown here. So it's 1 over r di by dy r of r rho vr plus 1 over r di by dy theta rho v theta plus di by dy z of rho v z. It looks more complicated, but it's actually not very complicated to derive at all. 
and that's very useful and we will be using it when we look at fully developed flow in pipes. So I'd like to end with just a simple example. An engineer claims to have found a solution for a particular incompressible flow and in Cartesian coordinates the proposed solution is given here where we have v equals 4x plus 2y plus 3z in the i direction, so in the x direction, 2x minus 3y plus 3z in the, in the y direction or in the j hat direction, 3x plus 2y plus 2z in the k or z direction. And you're asked to find out is this flow steady or unsteady and does it satisfy conservation of mass? In other words, does it satisfy the continuity equation? So these three components here are U, V, and W. And so you can see, answering the first question, is it steady or unsteady? You might pause the video and think about this for a moment. So I'll give the answer. The flow is steady. You'll notice that U, V, and W, there's no time. There's no function of time. Because time does not appear in the velocity components, you have u is not a function of time, v is not a function of time, and w is not a function of time. So we have a steady flow. There's no time dependence. For the next question as to whether it satisfies conservation of mass, we need to show that this equation does or does not satisfy continuity. And so I've rewritten the velocity vector that we're given in the problem statement and reminding you that we have the u v and w components here in the i, j, and k direction. So what we're going to do is apply the general continuity equation. I'd start from this every time, if you like. You're told in the, well, we just determined that the problem is steady, so we can get rid of d rho v t, but you, it's also, you're told in the problem statement that it's incompressible. So if it's either steady or incompressible, that term goes. It doesn't require both. So now we can simplify this equation for incompressible flow, and we just end up with di u di x plus di v di y plus di w di z equals zero. Now we can evaluate the derivatives, noting that u is 4x plus 2y plus 3z, so di u di x is just 4. Di v di y is going to be minus 3. And di w di z is going to be 2. So we substitute those back into here, right? That goes into there, that goes into there, and that goes into there. And we get 4 minus 3 plus 2, 1 which equals 3. But the continuity equation says that those have to add up to 0. So the answer to part B is this flow is not possible. It doesn't conserve uh, mass. It doesn't obey the conservation of mass principle, so it's not a valid solution. And that completes this video.